Good afternoon, everyone. Eddie Webb, we are here at the new Media Lab at Mesa Community College. And we are very, very happy to once again have our president, Lori Burkwam, with us today. How are you doing? Great. Thank you, Eddie. The last time we spoke, we wanted to talk a little bit about wellness in a COVID world and just kind of in general, uh, how people are doing. Uh, so how are people doing? <laughs> Well, I should be asking you, how are you doing? And that's that's a good start, right? Um, I think I was just having a conversation with some people up in the well, online because everything's remote, and just that sense of like I'm tired of talking to a computer, and you know I want to be physically in space with other people. And funny, I was driving through and picking up a you know, something from a store, and I found myself really engaging with a person who was at the drive through window, right? And they were probably like, okay, enough talking to me, all right, already. Um, could you move on? I need to your order or whatever. Um, and, but I, I say that, Eddie, because I do think that there's, we're, we're yearning for that human connection again. And we're not getting that, quenching that thirst through the amazing work that we can do via WebEx or Zoom or, or Google Meet or whatever, that we just don't have it. Like, I don't, I, I mean, we're in the same space right now, yeah. even though we're physically distanced safely with a plexiglass. But I, I see you. I see the light in your eyes. I see the energy. I feel your energy. I feel Keegan's energy. I mean, we, we work off each other with that. I was doing a, a little video um, with Thor the Thunderbird for our students this afternoon, earlier today. And again, there was that energy and you could feel the energy. And I think people are yearning for that. I think it was really novel. I mean, it was novel and fearful and lots of scariness when we first started this nearly a year ago. Oh, yeah. March will be a year. It sort of freaks me out. I've been president more remote than I was executive vice president in person. But but I say all that to set up, Eddie, that I think there's a lot going on in people's lives where we used to have a much more clear delineation between this is work and this is home. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that was a problem in and of itself. But now we have a, a true blend, and I think that also adds a different level of stress. So the idea that you could be in a meeting with your boss, whoever your boss may be, and your kid comes in and is suddenly spewing Cheerios out of their mouth and it gets all over your computer. And so life, I think, has become more and more blended. I will also say that on the heels of just finishing what I would call this kind of a lengthy weekend or some people celebrated Thanksgiving, many people didn't get together. Like it was just me and my spouse. We didn't have anybody over. We didn't go anywhere. We just stayed, had our little dinner, um, you know, watched something on TV and pretty much went to bed. It's a really exciting life, I got to tell you, right? Um, but, but I tell you that because I do think that more and more families are struggling. My family's really struggling that I'm not coming home for the holidays. The first time in my entire life that I haven't been home for the winter holidays. And so there's lots going on and pulling people in multiple directions, pulling at our heartstrings. And so how we care for ourselves, and, and Dr. Rendon talked about this, you know, self-care and healing through these times, and how are we taking care of ourselves so we can better take care of each other? Yeah. That was long, wasn't it? I'm no, sorry. That, that's that's <laughs> fine. You know, I know the feeling. I felt sorry for Marcy. She just walked in here to say hi, and I did it like a, 20 minute on the spot lecture because I'm just dying to talk and teach and <laughs> interact with someone. You know, it was horrible. I apologize. I said, man, I'm sorry. You're like, you're the first person outside of Keegan and Paul I've talked to in a month, you know, other than doing the podcast. And uh, yeah, I think I know for a fact my students have communicated that very sentiment, you know, that they just miss being at school. They miss being with their you know, their cohorts, their teachers in a room, you know, working it through, having a college experience. They just really miss it. And I think 
I'm kind of happy to hear that because I think we're working through distance learning. Like distance learning has its place. Mm-hmm. And well, I mean, we have a whole college committed to distance learning, Rio Solano. And we do hybrid. And, you know, there's a lot of provision that we've made for people who need distance learning. But at the center of it, people want, we're tribal, you know, we're community. We're and people need that. That's what I have been uh, really, really uh, uh, doing a lot of walking meditation now. So I have some books. I love listening to books on audio book. And I walk these canals with my dog every, almost every day. We've attended uh, several of our ceremonies, you know, where people have really taken precautions and been tested and all of that. And I've, I've actually got to kind of reprioritize some of my type A ambitions, you know, <laughs> and forget and realize, oh, sitting at a fire, you know, Looking with at un- the stars. Uncle Larry, you know, and having some brewed tea and, uh, you know, watching the dogs play and breaking bread. That's what's, you know. That's what's important. It's, it's definitely foundational, you know, to, uh, all the stress of trying to build a program and run a program and do all the stuff that we want to do, you know, like I forget sometimes to, to, to do that, to take a step back. And as you said, you know, we also started this press, the new media lab press in which people are writing. And I think that's been very <laughs> therapeutic for almost yes, everyone. Yes. Everyone that's written has at least sent me an email saying, you know, thank you. I think I kind of needed to do that, you mm-hmm. know? And so it will happen in due time. It is a little scary to, I don't have a TV at home and try not to watch too much news. You know, I prefer to read and listen to podcasts and do stuff, but uh, I need to be informed. And I, you know, Keegan is a great resource for what's (laughs) happening in the world. He he stays up on stuff and, uh, you know, this, the spike, I guess, that we're going through with, with COVID and, and all of that, um, it makes it even uh, more challenging, you know, because you have on the one hand, you have people that want to get back to it. And on the other hand, we, we might be in a more difficult position now than we were, you know, however many months ago, you know. It is definitely an interesting time, you know. But I think uh, one of the things that I... Uh, read lately that has really inspired me is it's better to light a candle than curse the darkness. And I keep that real, real close to me because, you know, when you go through those dissertation phases and stuff, you become very (laughs) analytical, like what's the problem, right? Well, you know, let's, 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 you know, and we get stuck in diagnosis, I think sometimes in public education for too long. We don't move into treatment you know or practice like okay yeah we've got these problems but let's let's all get together and do something you know i love that eddie because i do think that that inertia happens when you over process something or you continue to sort of swirl as i call it and taking an action doesn't have to be the perfect one doesn't have to be because what I have found in life is there's usually several right answers. There's not just one. That's right. And so how do we, how do we pick an answer and move in that direction? Um, I will also say to what you have said is that the concept for me of, I, and this is, I'm going to own it, is like I don't think I knew how good I had it. Like that moment of like, wow, I miss the interactions at the college. I miss walking to and from buildings, seeing students go, talking to students, saying hello, seeing people in their space um, that, you know, they're making a difference in the lives of students. And I think maybe there's a part of it I took for granted. And I, w- I want to remember that feeling. Yeah. So I don't do that again. What am I learning from this experience, yeah. right? I think most people who are paying attention to themselves and uh, are having that same sort of collective thought, you know, like 
So on, on that, to me, that is when we talk about wellness, that's why I like that word, wellness. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there, there was a word in my dad's language, I think it's uh, the sense of things being good all around. And when we look at wellness, we talk about the physical aspect, the mental, the spiritual, the emotional, the social, and the environmental. It's not one-dimensional. And I think, again, I remember when wellness degrees and wellness curriculum sort of came on the scene, you know, where it was, because people were sort of tired of this allopath, uh, linear, scientific uh, anatomy approach, you know, to, to sickness. And that people understand that these systems, you know, all work together. And that when you get into the wellness and the holistic approach, these are things, again, indigenous people have been talking about Mm -hmm. forever, right? Mm -hmm. We are all related, you know, we're all connected. And that consciousness sort of revisits uh, American society about every 25 years, you know? Uh, And then it it takes something like, like this for us to, step back for a minute and wake up, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the, one of the things that uh, I always appreciated about as, as I was kind of getting to know you uh, is uh, at, at least in your, what, what, was the, what was the position? Executive something? What was <laughs> executive it? vice president. E- executive vice president. <laughs> was that you sort of started a campaign around kindness, and people were talking about kindness because it was getting, it was, we were getting, it was getting kind of rough, you know. Uh, I really like that, you know. And we try, we that's why we've been really trying to be good partners with different agencies around campus, you know, and not to fall into the the, the trap. And so all of these things, you know, we're constantly moving in and out, you know, of our own personal struggle and then our struggle with it, where we are in the community and then our professional struggles. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Mike Calloway wrote in his piece, he said, you know, I used to have this real healthy boundary between work and home, and now I'm teaching at my kitchen table. Mm-hmm. And so I think people are trying to figure out that balance, you know. And it's an important one. Yeah. And now we've brought in, I know you've brought in a speaker or two around this. What else are we doing for people? Well, um, we partnered with Leadership, and that's a national, maybe international company, and offered some sessions for staff and faculty, and then a separate session for students on resilience Mm. and reminding ourselves of and exercising our resilience muscle. I think that that's important. You probably, at nausea, saw my wellness videos, Wellness Wednesday videos, um, jogging, swimming, playing pickleball, hiking. That's an important outlet for me, is making sure that I am physically active in some way, shape, or form. And I did that here, too. You would see me in my running clothes going out at lunchtime to run the Mesa Mile or or whatnot, um, go down and work out with a student. I had a student trainer who was part of a class, was actually my personal trainer. I think being outside and that concept of environmental uh, is really important to me. And hiking, looking at the sky, feeling the crunch of your feet on a path, uh, being able to inhale deeply and realize the both the importance and the lack of importance of you in this big wide world and how um, that feeds me, nourishes me. And, you know, one thing that we don't talk much about is the mental or the emotional aspects. And I'm grateful we have insurance, so that's something that our employees can take advantage of is that emotional wellness piece or uh, mental, su- mental wellness support. And that's another piece that we don't talk about. We don't talk about that and the value that that adds to our lives in helping keep us connected, but also understand that there are different things that are triggers for us. Right. Um, that's important. So that emotional and mental wellness are, are equally important when we think about that totality of wellness. It's sort of like... Uh... 
we're kind of in monastery mode or something. <laughs> you know, like people can we have are. these experiences and thoughts, but there's no, if you can't really share it and realize it in the community, it, it, it doesn't seem as real or as appreciative. And I think maybe, I think maybe that is, uh, you know, another thing that everybody is learning, you know, is that we have a lot of personal responsibility to show up, uh, right. In a good way that the responsibility of our health and our well being is, is uh, really up, up to each person, you know, and how they're going to design that. It sounds like you have a, a structure around what you're doing. You're going to meet your trainer and you're going to walk at this time, right? And you schedule. And I, I have found that uh, very, very uh, important to me as well that I, you know, schedule. I'm going to, at seven in the morning, I'm on the trail, you know, I'm a, I'm a morning guy, but right now, I mean, if the sun was up, I want to be out, you mm -hmm. know, I tried uh, baking bread because I'm getting, getting ready to go see my granddaughters and I wanted to express, impress them by making bread. <laughs> what a disaster, man. Yeah. Complete disaster. <laughs> I've, I've baked a couple of things that turned out I can actually use in the block wall I'm building in my backyard. <laughs> yeah, learning about nutrition, I think that's something that, mm -hmm. that I think is very, very important to people. I know when I was over here before all of this, I was a total stress eater. I wasn't really thinking about nutrition, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this is, I mean, this is my, my thing, I guess, that I've really learned about uh, appreciating the food that I put in my body and uh, I've lost 16 pounds since all of this has started just learning to do things differently I want to stick around for a little little bit you know but, we want you to stick around yeah well that's good yeah. though you went the other way from the COVID-19 you you dropped or going to drop 19 pounds yeah. where I've heard many people talk about gaining the COVID-19 uh, oh, okay and gaining that weight but that I'm glad. And so when you're out at seven in the morning going for a walk along the canals with your dog, what do you, what, what's in your mind? What's in your heart? What, what is it that, you know, gets you there? It's cold. Got to get out of a nice warm bed. Love all that free air conditioning early in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm listening to the audiobooks. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this uh, Japanese practice. It's, it, it's an offshoot of bonsai, you know. Uh, and downtown, there is a Japanese friendship garden, and it's a walking, it's built for walking meditation. And that's where I kind of learned about it. So I, 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 it's a, that's what I do. I find a book, you know, that I really like, and I listen to it on my headphones, and I just walk, and I listen, and I, you know, I think meditation for me, I'm, I'm learning more about that outside of ceremony at, at home. Uh, is, you know, is to think. And the thing about a human that, I guess, in the scale of beings, one of the things more of a Eurocentric type of philosophy is that, you know, we have to be on top as the human, you know, I guess because we're the most violent, really. But uh, this idea of just sort of being 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 in the moment and what humans have the uh, amazing ability to do around our consciousness is to think about what we're thinking about right be intentional yeah and so that's what i do that's what i've been doing and i love to write so i write every day i try to read every day and i try to listen and this is just a practice you know as an old man now that i'm uh that I'm really embracing. If it wasn't for the COVID, I probably wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have the time. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a horrible type A, high energy guy. You know, I need to be solving problems. I need projects. I need big, I'm, I'm learning not to find big mountains to climb, but little hills are just fine. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Yeah, that's what I've. That's what I think about. I I've always I grew up playing sports. You know, I feel like I'm getting interviewed now. This, is our president good or what? See how she turned the tables on me. 
Yeah, that's what you do to type A people. In fact, I love you, Eddie. In fact, you know what? I'll I will say this now. We had this one president who was he was a real high type A guy. And when I interviewed here, uh, I was up at the cabinet. They're up on the third floor. They're uh, sitting with him and the chair and the dean. And he said to me, uh, so what do you think about multicultural? And he said, what, what, what do you think about multicultural? Like we have a center where there's veterans and then there's, you know, these people and these people and people. And I, I sat back in my chair and I said, what do you, what do you think about that? And he went on for 15 minutes. I never <laughs> said a word. And when we were done, he was like, I really like this guy. You know, that was a great answer. I never said a word. Wow. You know? So I think that's what's happening to me, listeners. No, it's not happening. <laughs> the type A. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you got to, uh, what do you do when you're exercising? What, do you, what are you thinking about? Well, similar to you, I like um, just the, the feel of if I'm running, you know, the my legs pounding on the ground or the feel of the ground coming up through my leg. Um, How are your knees doing? My knees are pretty good, are amazingly they? so, even yeah. though I was a fast pitch catcher. And I did that until oh, I was 50. Too. Really? My favorite was throwing out people when they were stealing. Mine too. Trying to steal second base. I'm yeah. like, uh-uh, you, don't, you underestimate this arm. Right. Um, at any rate, I, I uh, also listen to a lot of podcasts. Okay. And so have, have really looked forward to that time of both learning yeah. and feeling. Because I, I believe firmly in those who are listening now, we're eliciting some feeling from you. That's right. So how do you name those emotions? How do you yeah. talk about those? And, this, and COVID has given me that gift of right. being able to spend time with myself doing those things. I miss the social aspects, though, Eddie. I miss them a lot. So, so when you're running, is that what you're thinking about? Is missing? No, no. Or? I'm, I'm, I'm much more listening to the podcasts and yeah. and the feeling of my body, whether yeah. it's against the wind or the sun on my face. Or, I love those feelings and yeah. being able to, maybe catch a whiff of something that it may be an orange blossom or, you know, just the. The desert that has just maybe had water on it. Not rain, of course, because we haven't had much of that. But I know. Um, I love those smells. Uh, um, so I, I'm a sensory. I'm very tactile. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's important to me. You know, uh, one of the questions that I've always liked to ask people in your position is, what is your process? Because you're going to hear things, you know, about our institution that, you know, I'm never going to come in contact with, you know, that's HR, grievances, or, you know, all that. You're all, really the underbelly, aren't you? You're just pulling it out. Here, yeah. Eddie. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've asked, I have, I've almost asked every president that we've had here and every leader, like, what is the, how do you stay above that? Right. Like, how do you not, you, you have to manage those sorts of things. But from a wellness perspective, how do you, you know what I mean? How do you not let, like, like let that get you, you know, how do you keep your, you know, how do you keep that positive energy going? I mean, I know what I do, what uh, I, do, I use visualization. So like I will, I have sat for hours visualizing the new media lab, seeing it, closing my eyes. And as an athlete, you know, I was a linebacker through college and I fought for many years. And so, you know, before a game or a match, I would sit, I would close and I would see it in my mind. Mm. And I would do that over and over and over. And because I believe in that kind of stuff, you know, I believe that you can't, you're the master of your own creation. And when you have, a, what is it, rumination problems mm -hmm. like that I have, uh, you know, you visualize that stuff, right? But I've always been fascinated from the, I went through the chair academy and then mm. I went and got that doctorate degree in higher ed leadership and all that. And I was always very interested because I'm very, very, I, my future, I want to incorporate conflict resolution. Mm. I'm very, very fascinated with conflict resolution. And so I've read a lot about 
leaders, you know, global leaders who brought, who have conflict. I mean, that's why I'm asking the question. Like, it must be hard. You know, you have all this chatter that needs attention. Do you have a, a what is your process to just to, to stay above and keep moving forward? Or, or do you have a process? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or do you? Yeah. That's a good question. Or do you have a process? Um, let's hope I have a process. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or you, our listeners are going like, no, what is she doing? Yeah. Yeah. What's her role yeah, with yeah. the college? Um, Eddie, I think, I mean, visualization, I too have athletic background. And so mm-hmm. that has been certainly a part of who I am. When I, I, can, I would be um, less than authentic if I said some of it doesn't pull at my heart. Right? I mean, that, that right. it should. You want a leader with heart. And if it's an HR issue, if it's a personnel issue or, or whatnot. I mean, of course, there's, there's those things that tug at my heart. I always go back to my touchstone are our students. Right. So how are we, how, how is this going to help our students? Right. How are we helping our students? How are we paving the way for them to, to achieve their dreams? That's what it is for me. But, but it would also, I would also be remiss if I didn't say, if there was an interpersonal conflict or if there was a a challenge. I often think about, I wonder what Eddie was like as a small child. What messages was he given growing up? What did he learn about himself growing up? Hmm. Because, you know, you talked about kindness and, and I know people, there's a lot of people who would poo-poo kindness. I should have got poo-poo kindness. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Keith. Um, um, it, because it's, it's one of those sort of trite things like, yeah, well, we have whatever kindness. Right. Um, but a part of it is also acknowledging that I don't know what you walk with in the world. Right. I have no idea the struggles you carry in your bag with you or the life that you led to get you to this point. But I want to honor that. I want to honor the triumphs, the struggles, the hiccups, the potholes. I want to honor that and be fully present when you are talking to me. Even if I'm like, I, Eddie is so angry with me, he's like, you know, he, he's fireballs are coming out of his eyes. How do I be fully present and understand that there's hurt or pain there that maybe I m- ignited or maybe I didn't, but you deserve, you, you deserve another human being to be with you at this time mm. and to be fully present. So that's one thing that I have found is how do I pull myself to the present? Not thinking about how to solve the problem or to take care of you know, the anger that somebody may have or the frustration. But how do I stay fully present so they know that I'm listening? Mm. Do I always do it great? No. I have to keep reminding myself of that practice and reminding myself that every human being is worthy of being present alongside. Every human being is worthy. And everybody's walked a different path to get here. And some paths maybe were easier or seemingly easier than others. That's beautiful. That's a, it's, that's a, that's deep. You know? <laughs> that's maturity. Uh, actually, for me, the, how I even, even kind of got going in this direction it, later in life was I had written a story about coming off the streets. Mm. Uh, the CTL had asked me to write a thing, and I thought, you know, the, the thing I you know, wanted to value in myself is truth. You know, in fact, in the new media lab, we call our projects were truth tellers not storytellers Mm -hmm. you know so I just I went ahead and did it you know I mean I just wrote about I mean I read my first book locked up as a juvenile they used to call it gladiator school the California Youth Authority Uh, I was very angry and didn't know why what a blessing it has been to be on this journey uh, that education has given me I was very very fortunate to fall in love with reading and reading was my world after after that experience you know i saw the hurt in my parents eyes i never i see my dad cry two times in my life when his when we sat and held hands with his dad as he passed away and the day they put me in shackles and when sent me off to a, a detention center for juveniles and I swore I would never, ever create that in someone else again. And so writing about that got me a scholarship 
to call it. It was the craziest thing I ever seen, telling the truth. And those are the kids that I always look for, you know, to help. I understand it. I can't tell you the experiences I've had here where I've grabbed young guys, just grabbed them up by the arm, pulled them in, said, listen, man, I'm not, I'm not quitting on you. You're not going to quit on you, and I'm not going to quit on you. We're going to get through. You can be as mad as you want. I'm okay with that. I understand that. Let's don't stay there, you know. Hey, everybody, Eddie Webb. We're getting deep here today <laughs> in our wellness conversation with our president, Lori Braquam. Today we're talking about wellness in the uh, COVID environment and uh, sharing little personal journeys that we've heard about or we've been on ourselves. And uh, one project that we're working with uh, currently is a uh, person through our foundations who has uh, started a beauty industry degree and has partnered with Mesa Community College as well as Arizona State University. And as we were talking about uh, these areas of wellness, uh, one of the questions I had for her was, you know, you could be sitting on a beach in the Caribbean all day, you know, and you've decided to pony up uh, scholarships for 12 students and uh, work this way through. I said, what was your epiphany moment, you know, that you had that you realize you can have all of this uh, stuff, but, but if you want to be wealthy on the inside, uh, I have found that altruism is what works for me is to help somebody that can't do anything to help me back. And I do that and I do that quietly and I've always done it for 30 something years. I've always practiced helping people who can't help me and I don't tell people about it. And that's how I've learned over the years to have a little bit of self-esteem. Uh, and I asked her about that, you know, like, what was your moment? And she said, when my mother died, mm-hmm. you know, going through the process of watching her mother pass away. And, and I don't think she would mind me talking about this because we've actually already talked about it once <laughs> on the podcast and Monday we're interviewing her again. But you had that real moment of what the essence of life is and that the clock's running, you know. Uh, when you're young, you don't, you don't, you think you have forever. And when you reach where we're at in our stage in life, our station in, in the generations, you realize, Ooh, you know, the clock's ticking. And so we were talking about as, you know, people in leadership positions, we get to hear people want to sound, you know, use us as a sounding board, maybe with their frustrations or, you know, what they want to do. And how you keep your eye on the prize, you know, which is obviously, we, we all sort of hide behind student success, right? Sure. Hide behind it or maybe, well, I hope we don't hide behind it, but I hope it shores us up. But I mean, that usually is the thing that we all get around to agreement on. You know, this is about the students. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it is for folks, sometimes it's not. Have you had that moment? Have you had that moment in your own life about, you know, that keeps you out of the fray and on track of what your, what your life vision is and the mission for this work that you want to do? Wow, Eddie, um, you're right. We are getting deep. I will tell you that it was about three years ago when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, I was coming from Minneapolis back to Madison on the highway, Highway 94 you know, go on the speed limit, of course. But, and I got the call and the, and the nurse said, can you pull over? And I said, I'll pull over and call you back at the next rest area. I'm by myself in my car. And I pull over at the rest area and she delivered the news to me that yes, I, um, the biopsy demonstrated that I had breast cancer and that they would be beginning the process of having conversations with me about what that meant. I'll tell you that, you know, I, I'm what's healthy. I am healthy. I'm, I eat well. I don't smoke. I don't drink or drink at moderation. And I take care of myself, um, exercise regularly, have checkups, et cetera. So I thought, no, not me. They have to have this wrong. They were right. And um, I went through 
surgery and then chemotherapy. And, you know, there's something about being hooked up to the chemo chemotherapy pulsing through your veins when the people who are putting it into you are fully suited up, right? I learned later that this is, you know, that some of chemotherapy actually came from mustard gas that they used to. That's right. Yeah. It, it, which was a chemical agent in World War One, But, uh, you know, as I'm sitting there with the drip, and I actually had a port, so I had it going in through um, the port, and it would be all day, right? It would, I had it done on Fridays, and it would be an all-day thing. And um, so you have a lot of time to think, and you have a lot of time to consider, like, maybe if I, if I beat this, what am I going to do with my life? Because I don't have much time left. And I think I was one of those people who lived in that flurry of type A, you know, I'm great, I'm doing good, I'm going to keep going, I'm going to do this job that I was doing at the University of Wisconsin until I retire. I love my job. But you have that epiphany of like, what else do you want to do? What do you stand for? Mm -hmm. You only have so much time left in this world. What do you want to do with that time? And I've had a number of those aha moments in my life, honestly, but that one probably is the most recent. And y you, you are face-to-face -face with your morality um, and mortality, and both of them combined of, like, what do you stand for? And you ain't got much time left on this planet. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with that time? How are you going to make it count? Um, can I get into the fray of things and, um, you know, the people who have different viewpoints than me are? Absolutely. I try not to. I try to think, you know, how is this contributing to the greater good? Because anybody can think negative things. Anybody can tear somebody down. The people I want to be next to, that I want alongside me, are those who are going to build others up. Because in the end, how good do you feel about tearing anybody down or anything down? I mean, to me, it's a bit caustic and cancer-like. I've had enough cancer in my life right now, and I'm, mm. no thank you. So um, that's probably one of the pivotal moments for me. Thank you for asking. Yeah. And, and probably many people know that about me. But, you know, there's a part of it that you just talked about Francis and beauty and I remember like, you know, you lose all your hair when you are going through the chemo that I went through. And um, so I have a bald head and, and I don't look particularly good with the bald head. Um, and I chose to wear hats, right? Some people make different choices to wear wigs or scarves or whatever. And my, my chosen coverage was hat because that, that just fit for me. And you don't feel very beautiful when you go through chemo. Mm. You don't feel very, like, I mean, it's just, a, it's tough on your body. Your body is like, you know, it's like nothing is, it doesn't feel like you. Um, and so when you get back to feeling, and people said, you'll get back to feeling good. I'm like, really? Because you feel so bad. I mean, I remember one after one chemo treatment, I was calling Karen and saying, just bring me anything that is like easy to eat, saltine crackers or 7-Up or rice or something, because I felt so horrible. And when you feel that horrible, you don't want that. You don't wish that on your worst enemy. You just don't. And I think about the children who have had cancer, colleagues who have had cancer, people who have died from cancer, people who walked this college campus, and we're at MCC who have died of cancer. It's a horrible disease, and we shouldn't, I don't want to waste a single minute of my life because I don't know how much longer I have, and none of us do. It's precious every day. There's, a, there's notes up here on this whiteboard behind me, epistemology lecture given by Charlie Morris passed away last Thanksgiving. He was my best friend uh, here. He was English professor, the best teacher of language I've ever been around. Controversial, real rough around the edges, 
like me came into teaching at 40, you know, been in the private sector and then sort of had to adjust to government life. And, uh, you know, that was hard for him to do. I don't think he ever mastered it. But, you know, to go through that process uh, with him and to sit with him and colleagues from the school came. The, we all sat with him in hospice and talked to him. And, you know, you have that, you have those experiences that this thing does wrap up. And it, it, it can stay with you for a while, but I really like the word you use earlier is that you have a practice. And I really like that, to have a practice. Because I think, you know, whether you're, you're in administration or you're a teacher transitioning, I, I've transitioned into an educator. And I try to talk about this a lot to people because they're like, what do you mean? You know, like, you'll, you'll see. You know, one day you'll see. And, you know, first of all, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing uh, your experience with cancer and the lessons that you have learned from it, you know, and I hope our listeners uh, take that in and take a moment with that, you know, and you don't have to wait till you get cancer. Don't wait. You can, uh, you know, you can be awake now. And I think most teachers are anyway. I've never met a bad teacher in my life. Uh, I hear about that stuff, but I've personally have never, never met a bad teacher. I think it, most teachers that are in it are in it for the right reasons and, and all of that. But it's the approach. Right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's how we process everything. And you've talked about early childhood development and all of those dynamics that people are, you know, I think some people can get labeled with things that are not true or, you know, there's like all kinds of stuff happening there. Right. But when you're standing in front of the classroom, you know, man, those students, they pick up on everything. <laughs> if you're in a good mood, a bad mood, you know, they, they know. Right? And, and that to me is the art of, of teaching. And I, I fail. I can't tell you how much I fail. I fail constantly, but I'm no longer afraid of failure. I think a failure to me is one of the best things that, that, that can happen. You know, if you're awake and you're willing and open to learn from it, you know, my mother had breast cancer and I would uh, take her down for her treatments. This one time when we uh, got to the hospital, she, you know, hadn't said anything to me, but we get there and we, she says, we opened the trunk of my car. And uh, I'm like, yeah, sure, of course. And then we open it up, and she's got these bags in there, right? Presents, baked goods, and stuff. And when we went in there, she had baked stuff and made stuff and bought presents for the nurses, for the <laughs> doctors. For the, you know what I mean? That's, mm. Those are the kind of women I grew up around, right? Just completely altruistic. Never even brought it up, you know? Just was always, you know trying to appreciate people and you know uh, another great lesson for me you know about like you know how to move through obstacles in life you know and become a better better person for it and I, I thank her for that all the time she's still like she's been like that my grandparents were like that my grandmothers were like that always of service to others and they've all lived very very long lives and my grandmother was 108 when she passed away, my mom, I think, was, well, I won't say it because she listens to these. <laughs> sorry, sorry, mom. Uh, but, but that idea, you know, of, uh, you know, not being afraid to, to, to get involved, you know, with uh, altruism and the service to others is, is the most honorable work uh, that we can do. And when you have life and death experiences or near death experiences or possible death experiences, definitely it's a it's a door you know and you can go through whichever door you want to go through i mean some people get these things and become very bitter right and some people rise and become better a light you know um what's and, your quote i'd rather light a candle than was, sit in darkness it was something john f kennedy had quoted from a philosopher during a a speech that he was given and I'm a student of the, both Ro uh, more Robert Kennedy than John Kennedy. And be because I was interested in grief 
Mm-hmm. And uh, when John was assassinated, you know, John F. Kennedy was Robert's world. He was his identity, his big brother, his everything. You know, to be assassinated, uh, he went into a really reflective time and emerged stronger than, of course, you know, he was assassinated. But during that time, you know, he wrote, uh, he wrote a lot of stuff. And I was reading that. That's where I read in one of the speeches he gave. He said, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Mm-hmm. And like I say, I, I've, I've often thought about getting that tattooed on my forearm uh, just as a reminder. But then I realized I don't, I don't need any more tattoos. So, <laughs> yeah, right? It's all about perspective and the journey that we're on. And I hope for our listeners, you know, our students, uh, a part of this conversation, um, we want to be authentic. And we know that a lot of you out there are facing a lot of challenges, whether that's health or financial. We know, I know, you know, I'm getting communications from students that, oh, you know, you've lost your job or you're not getting enough hours in the restaurants and you're trying to do something with your life in terms of education. And so, I hope our sharing today will encourage you to not quit. Even as hard as it is, we still live in one of the greatest countries in the world. And so we know uh, the folks here at Mesa Community College, not to brag, but uh, I just think we're one of the best in the country, if not in the world, with the systems that we have and the support that we have. And we just want you to know we have to learn to be a family over here. Not a, not a crazy family either, but a, you know, a family of people that are really looking out for each other, right? And uh, come to us and you know, let, us, let us help. You know? we, we, we're trying, everyone is trying the best that we can, but we want to just recognize that we understand that all of you, faculty and students and staff, you know, are facing, you know, difficult times, but this too shall pass and be prepared for when we come back, we're going to come back bigger, better, and stronger. I believe that with every fiber in my body, you know, and we're going to appreciate the opportunities that we have to come together a lot more than we did before. Yeah. As I said earlier in the podcast, I think there are some things we took for granted. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, we want to thank you guys uh, for listening today. There's a, we always give our guests the opportunity for some last words. What do you want to say, <laughs> President Perkwong? Well, if there's anything that we've learned from our session today, you know, talking about wellness and talking about journeys, is that life is short and that we can't predict our future but we can have a hand in it. We have choices that we make. Every day we wake up, that we get to wake up as a gift. And you can wake up with a big old chip on your shoulder and say, woe is me. Or you can wake up and knock that chip off and say, hey, let's go do something. Um, And let's do it with each other. I have found more often than not, when I'm willing to link arms with someone, we're much stronger than if I want to sit across the table and be adversarial with someone. Find the common ground. Be altruistic. Do something for someone else that they'll never know you're doing for them. It will make you feel even better than it makes them feel. Take care of yourself. And that that comes on so many different dimensions. And I know that some of us have more resources than others to do that. Let's name that. And then let's address that. Life is short, and I'm living proof that it's so incredibly short, and I I want to value and love every moment I get to walk on this campus, in the state of Arizona, on this earth. It's a gift. It's a huge gift, and um, my legacy should be, what good did I do with that gift? Beautiful, beautiful. Hello, everybody. Eddie Webb. We are here at the New Media Lab having a conversation with our president, Lori Perquam, about wellness. Keeping it real, as the young people say. You know, in my dad's language, they say, Dona de go e wado. 
Oh, you ski gali ka yeah, we're very, very grateful. We'll, we will see each other again, as they, they say. And most importantly, everybody, take care of each other out there. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.